your team into masters of the oh, thank you. I can I card will then take you right to the source of the most important genre creators of their generation. Authors, actors, directors, science fiction, fantasy, comics, film, and other creators that shape our genre fiction and entertainment. Get ready to leave the world of the everyday behind and go head to head with the masters of the genre. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Masters of the Genre. I am here, as you can see, with Mr. Greg Bear. And he is the author of more than 30 books spanning thrillers, science fiction, and fantasy, including Blood Music, Eon, The Forge of God, Darwin's Radio, City at the End of Time, and Hull Zero Three. His books have won numerous international prizes, have been translated into more than 22 languages, and have sold millions of copies worldwide. Over the last 28 years, he has also served as a consultant for NASA, the U.S. Army, the State Department, the International Food Protection Agency, and Homeland Security on matters ranging from privatizing space to food safety, the frontiers of microbiology and genetics, and biological security. Welcome, Greg Bear, to Masters of the Genre. Thank you. Great to see you. Great to be here. It's wonderful to have you here. Um, I'd like to get off uh, on uh, Blood Music. Uh, it was first published as a short story in uh, 1983 and then expanded to a novel in 1985. It was. It has been credited as um, the first account of nanotechnology in science fiction. <laughs> the... A uh, short story is the first science fiction to describe microscopic medical machines and to treat DNA as a computational system capable of being reprogrammable. In later works, beginning with uh, Queen of Angels and continuing with Slant, you give detailed descriptions of a near future nanotechnological society. The sequence continues with heads which may contain the first description description of a quantum logic computer, as well as moving Mars. And the sequence also charts the uh, charts, the historical development of self awareness in AIs. You're not only a truly staggering <laughs> science fiction writer, Thank but you. your work is also prescient. Is this a simple instance of life follows art? Or were you digging at the science at the cutting edge as you were writing? I was enjoying the heck out of myself because, you know, as a kid, reading science fiction, the stuff that always got my head going was the most entertaining stuff. And reading Arthur C. Clarke or Jack Williamson or Paul Anderson or any of those masters really touched me because they were capable of handling so many different things I hadn't heard of before or seen before. And so I wanted to do that. And especially with Arthur C. Clarke, I think of uh, blood music as being a kind of a, a modern version of Childhood's End. And, uh, you know, it, it was my pleasure over the years to realize that a lot of my major influences were, in fact, reading me as I started publishing these books. And that was very, very wonderful. I imagine. Um. So, uh, as a as a a writer uh, and also a, a a scientist or or a science writer, uh, were you? Scientist. I was actually an English major, so <laughs> yeah. Well, I was too. So uh, it it got you a lot further than it got me. Um, I'm curious how these first descriptions of reprogrammable nanotechnology and uh, the quantum logic computer, which is, you know, these things are now 
um, no longer fiction, but are part of medical practice and, and, uh, coming out, uh, you know, uh, I think I heard recently that the first quantum computer had been, uh, created, although, uh, I, I don't know if that was a white paper or a rumor. No, it's, um, it's, it's actually out there. It's a real thing. It's just, we're not quite sure how advanced it is or what it does precisely. So you can buy one if you want to, but it won't be cheap. I bet not. I bet not. So as you were writing, uh, explain to us the process of how uh, the the way that you you know interacted with science with your writing and and vice versa. How did how did that you know. Was it the science that informed your writing or or the writing that informed later science? A uh, little back and forth. I would say the majority of it is science informs my writing. I love to read science journals and, and textbooks and stuff. And, and over the years, I've dipped into a lot of areas that I'm way outmatched with the mathematics for. I cannot, I cannot do the mathematics. But the ideas come pretty simply into my head and I play with them. And when I play with them, sometimes they come back out as a more ornate form of what I started out with. So I read a, a, an article in Science uh, in New Scientist back in the 1980s, 1982 or 83, 81. Mm -hmm. uh, I read an article about biochips, which were going to be, uh, uh, you know, reprogrammable silicon based micro miniature chips that would go into the body and do analysis inside the body. And for some reason, at that point, I'm looking at this article and I go, you know, I think that DNA is like a computer in many respects and that each cell might have the ability to do something this biochip could do. And uh, so I played with that for a while and, and finally wrote the story up and sent it off to uh, a couple of places. First of all, uh, a couple of places that rejected it, like Playboy, and uh, they didn't they thought I was kind of ucky. So I, I sent mm -hmm. it off to Analog, and at Analog, Stan Schmidt says, I think this is an interesting idea, but I'm not sure I believe it. Convince me. So I looked into the, the possibility that every single um, um, bit of amino acid or, or RNA or DNA in uh, a genome would be uh, capable of acting as a kind of single neuron. And I says, okay, well, there's going to be billions and billions of neurons in every cell then if this is the case. And that convinced Stan enough that he published the story. And the story was, I think, convincing enough for most people that they, uh, they actually appreciated it and gave me a couple of awards, which I was first time out, I was quite proud of. I'm sure. I'm sure. So in this case, you weren't asked to show your work. You were asked to show the work of others. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, uh, I think I'm following in the in the lead of Richard Feynman so often that he's got to be given credit because Mr. Feynman came up with nanotechnology. His version of it is kind of what we have with K. Eric Drexler and his version, uh, which I'm very uh, admiring of. Um, but it, it's it's silicon based. It's small silicon machines building even smaller machines, getting down to the microscopic level. And that I think we have already in terms of proteins and cells. Cells and proteins, proteins are very small machines. And sometimes they're really intricate machines capable of doing really intricate things. Polymerases, for example, do amazing work. Uh, and so that is already done. And that's, that's not nanotechnology, it's natural. So, mm -hmm. but in terms of, of, of having that be adapted for uh, our own uses, I always have preferred squishy over silicon based over, you know, over hard me, as it were. Yeah. 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 You know, it always seemed to me that silicon uh, could be very useful that way. And it is in many instances, uh, but the, but the proteins that fill us are actually extremely capable of doing the things that we call nanotechnology. In fact, they are the original nanotechnologies. I was, I was just about to say that, but, uh, of course, I wanted to let you finish your sentence. Um, as I've uh, mentioned in our, our previous communication, uh, uh, Masters of the Genre uh, is sort of uh, a freewheeling conversation more than a formal interview. So um, that's my excuse for being able to interrupt uh, you can uh, do that. my guests. 
Well, Although I, I, tr I try not to. Um, <laughs> I might interrupt myself. You know, I'm not, I'm not averse to doing that. So, uh, You and Gregory Benford and David Brin wrote a trilogy of prequel novels to Isaac Asimov's influential Foundation trilogy. You're credited for the middle book. And right. interesting coincidence, uh, Benford and Brin were the first two authors I got in touch with to discuss coming on the show and we're still working out the details. Uh, predicting Asimov's legendary literature uh, by, uh, I, I, I'm going to say, lesser writers uh, yeah. in, in air quotes, because uh, the three of you are certainly not uh, uh, uh you know, uh, any, any, uh, small, uh, potatoes, but, um, at the time, uh, or, or just in general, uh, uh, you know, such a thing could come off as hubris. How did the three of you decide to commence such a mammoth undertaking and who worked out which books you'd each tackle? That was Gregory Benford's thing. He's our master of hubris. Uh, he approached Janet Asimov <laughs> and said, uh, you know, we could we could put together a new trilogy and we could market it and, and put, you know, because if an author hasn't been around for a while writing, um, which unfortunately Isaac wasn't, um, they kind of fall out of favor in publishing. So if you keep their, their names foremost, you can keep the books in print and keep interest going. And that's kind of what I think she, he was pitching to Janet and Janet agreed. And so she allowed us with a great deal of generosity to work in Isaac's universe and uh, to make it kind of official. And it became what I later described as the new foundation trilogy. Mm -hmm. It wasn't exactly a prequel because my book actually takes place uh, during the time period of the first novel. Mm -hmm. And Gregory's book is, uh, I think, a bit of a precursor. But David's takes and wraps up nearly all the rest of Isaac's universes. And he had a great fun doing that. And, and boy, you know, I, I kind of feel that we all explored different territories, which is good because we didn't interrupt or barge into each other. Mm -hmm. And and so we managed to create, I think, a fairly popular new trilogy. And uh, and I think our, the Asimov fans were, were very appreciative of being able to go back to one of their favorite subjects in the world. And now we've got the, uh, the uh, TV or movie version coming out. And uh, it yeah, was so very spectacular. I was going to ask you about that. Uh, yeah. The uh, the foundation series is coming out. Are are the 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 trilogy that the three of you have written part of that? No, no. It's I think it's based entirely on Isaac's. We certainly didn't sell the rights, uh, uh, and so I suspect it's based entirely on Isaac's reckoning, but with a new imagination because of the the way the movies are done now creative people working in films kind of add to the universes they're creating the, or, uh, or recreating. The teaser trailer was certainly nothing short it's of amazing. Very nice. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I think uh, really requires the, the Dune movie to, uh, to drop uh, a trilogy, uh, a rather a, a teaser trailer that, that, uh, uh, you know, shows off, uh, the film that's at least as good uh, is this going to be on Apple TV? Is that right? Oh so, yeah, yeah, Foundation. yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I, I like the uh, I like the original Dune, uh, uh, David Lynch's version. I thought it was really quite remarkable and very very stylish and weird in a lot of interesting ways. In ways I think that match the way that Frank Herbert's book was weird. I read the book when I was 16 for the first time all the way through, although I'd, I'd been dipping into the serialized versions and analog. And and reading that book really set me up for the thinking of what a movie would look like. And, you know, David's movie actually did uh, a fair amount of that, and I liked it a lot. But it, it probably would have been served better had it been credited as having been done by a Russian director you know, like Tarkovsky or something, because mm -hmm. then people would, would set aside their preconceived ideas of what a movie would do. Mm. That's a you know, big American studio movie. Well, no, they can't do that, you know. Uh, and so they would have relaxed a little bit and really enjoyed the strangeness of, of Lynch's Dune, which is quite remarkable. But going into the new Foundation uh, series, um, it looks very good. 
And the new dune also looks very good. It's a kind of a different approach. But if you go back, Jodorowsky started off with this whole mm -hmm. dune project way back when. And his approach was quite different. And he brought in people like Giger and, and uh, Dan O'Bannon and, you know, a lot of people who would go on to do amazing things. Who eventually Especially, went into uh, Alien. Right, right. And so, yeah. you know, we've got a lot of, of film history emerging from these different projects, whether they worked or not, whether they actually failed or, 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 or got accomplished. How did you and uh, Gregory uh, Benford and David Brin uh, accomplish a, a common tone on, on the three books? Well, I suspect that tone is just because I, I – um, have a propensity when I'm reading an author I love, like Isaac, to try and figure out how he would have written this book. And so there are certain subject matters and certain uh, prose styles and so on that you can kind of pick up from Asimov and play with. And I was very pleased that Janet found that my book really did sound like Isaac in a lot of ways. That makes me proud. But, uh, but also, in a strange way, I had Isaac sitting on my shoulder, which since he didn't believe in afterlife or ghosts, I think he probably mm -hmm. felt very strange. And, uh, and at one point, as I was working with his subject in his universe, um, uh, got a call from Harlan Ellison and Harlan was calling and he said, you know, uh, um, I, I've got this idea for a story. And I thought, well, I told Susan, I'll, I'll, I'll call up Isaac and ask him for the scientific underpinnings of this. And I said, Oh shoot, I can't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. And says, so, so I'm going to call Greg instead. And, and, and so he ran the story past me and it was interesting. And I said, that's cool. And, and kind of, we talked about it. And then I had to hold myself back from saying, so Harlan, how can I help you? And that's my closest thing to an Asimov imitation. And, and, you know, <laughs> I thought that the, if I was going to be a go between between Harlan Olson and Isaac Asimov, then I could probably finish this book. Mm -hmm. And so was the, uh, the, the trilogy uh, that the three of you wrote a Harlan Ellison's idea? Oh, no, no, no. Harlan, uh, of course, did different other universes. And uh, uh, what did he write? This? He wrote iRobot, wrote a large uh, movie script for iRobot, as I recall, which was quite remarkable. And uh, as a good screenwriter, he could do a lot of that sort of thing. But no, I... I did not refer to Harlan when I was writing the uh, my section of the trilogy. Mm -hmm. um, I, I I may have lost my train of thought when you when you uh, brought in Harlan Ellison. <laughs> he does the, take us over, doesn't he? The trilogy. Well, he he. Uh, you know, I I cut my teeth on Harlan Ellison. Yep, I remember I um, when I was uh, very young. My my dad, who uh, was a science fiction junkie, uh, had a den. He, he was also a computer science professor for many, many years. Cool. And he had a, a den into which I was never allowed, and he kept locked. Uh, <laughs> and, and it was all covered in books. Oh, and I remember wow. when I was so young that I I had to look up to see the the books on the shelf I saw uh, dangerous visions and again, dangerous visions. Yeah. And I, I asked him if I could read those and he said, no. And <laughs> of course, since I've read them and I think, uh, looking back on it, 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 it has to do with the more adult themes that a, a five or a six year old who's into science fiction, maybe probably shouldn't be reading. Well, the language is also an issue in some of those stories. I think J.G. Ballard has a uh, an F word in his title. So, mm. uh, Ballard, I, I've never heard it pronounced, actually. Uh, well, I've I think that's said, how he would have pronounced it. I, I sat next to him and signed books for a while uh, and was very pleased to be you know, next to the, the man who had written all these strange and wonderful novels and also had written, of course, Empire of the Sun. And he was out promoting that at that point and, and a new book. And uh, so I, I think I think that's the correct pronunciation, but I'm sure someone out there knows if I'm wrong or not, or maybe I'm just pronouncing it with a, an American accent. And uh, if, uh, if you sat right next to him signing books, I, I'm sure uh, Ballard is, is the correct pronunciation. 
Well, it, it's, it's as good as I've got right now. So, uh, I, you know, there, there's also uh, Cabell, James Branch Cabell. I learned how to pronounce that. Rhymes with rabble, according to somebody. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, there's all, but my problem was in high school, I was using uh, the pronunciation Henline for Robert Heinlein. Uh, right. Until I got that corrected at one point. And then right. it was Heinlein. And, uh, you know, tried, I, tried, I, to, uh, tried to correct people from calling him Isaac Asimov. I says, no, it's Asimov. Or Isaiah. Yeah. Isaiac was another mispronunciation. I didn't use that one. I knew that. Weird. I, I guess I'm lucky I grew up in the household that I did. Mm-hmm. Um, my father <laughs> read me um, uh, Have Spacesuit Will Travel as Bedtime Stories and also uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs. Yeah. Um, living in Lawrence, Kansas, uh, as I do, uh, where the University of Kansas is. And, James Gunn uh, was the master of Lawrence, Kansas. Either yeah, that or Supernatural he, was the master. He is. Uh, yeah. uh, the uh, 2016 uh, Worldcon, Mid-Americon 2, was in Kansas City, and uh, wow. he was inducted as a, as a grand master of science fiction. And I was, uh, uh, as a, uh, ex student uh, of his, uh, I was the first, uh, up there to have him sign my, my, uh, uh, issue of campus and to congratulate him. And, uh, cool. he's, you know, uh, he's getting on, he's a little frail, uh, but he's unfortunately, still- unfortunately, Jim is no longer with us so. since when, well, since a few weeks ago, so goodness, sad that's news, news to me. Yeah, he had always been a presence at conventions and so on, and of course, he, he, I regard him as you know uh, a Mister our Mister Chips. Basically, he he was a very handsome and very capable teacher, and uh, I miss him. But going to conventions and seeing Jim Gunn or setting up the Science Fiction Museum and having him there, you know, to, to and also just using him as an expert to figure out what we're doing wrong. I'm really going to miss that. Yeah, he was certainly the uh, the uh, the holder uh, of the science fiction torch, and uh, I I not only took coursework from him, but was also uh, a member of his uh, writers' workshop. Mm-hmm. And the year I attended, there were eighteen of us with three stories each. Very cool. And um, uh, I always get the two of these mixed up, Paul Anderson and Frederick Pohl. It must have been Frederick Pohl, yeah. Uh, whose wife is uh, Elizabeth Ann Hall. Yes. And uh, they were two uh, of the uh, the sort of celebrity uh, uh, editors, if you will. Right. Uh, and it was my first experience at that level of having my work uh, sort of ripped to shreds and <laughs> and uh and then having it uh you know lovingly sort of on the back you know uh written all the things that i should have done and right. uh but it was a wonderful experience and uh it's interesting um when i was talking with uh with uh paul di filippo uh the other day um i think he uh also tried to convince me that uh james gunn had died and and uh i had just that day been on you know the the kusf site and had seen nothing about it so um, uh, well i'm embarrassed I that, uh, that i that i didn't know well but, you may have uh, you may have disbelieved honorably then it's good to keep people alive in our thoughts you know if we can all do so well it's also good to uh, to seek truth. Yeah. So, um, I, 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 uh, I don't like being wrong, but I'm a big enough man to admit when I am. Um, I, I wanted to tell you, I fell in love with the short story and then the novel blood music. Thank you. And I thought Aeon was one of the greatest books I'd ever read. Cool. Thanks. And then I continued reading Rudy Rucker and Bruce Sterling and Lewis Shiner <laughs> and John Shirley and William Gibson. Yeah. And as I began writing my own short stories, 
I found uh, Poppy Z Bright and anthologies and, and to be honest, sort of lost track of you. And so here you are uh, 50 books later with the unfinished land, 35. Okay. And so here you are with the unfinished land, uh, kind of a a trippy alternative, uh, alternate history fantasy novel. Yeah, Mythological historical fantasy. There you go. And you've been called the the complete master of the grand scale science fiction novel. And the Oregonian called your novel Moving Mars as good as hard science fiction gets. I appreciate that. After such a grand storied career of hard science fiction, why the unfinished land and why now? Well, I've always been a fantasy writer as well, and I model myself after my favorite writers like Paul Anderson and Elspring de Camp and and, uh, even Larry Heaven to some extent. Yeah. And all of these writers were able to write in both science fiction and fantasy. And of course, for Elspring de Camp, he helped create some areas of fantasy that influenced me. Absolutely. But Paul Anderson, I read The Broken Sword way back, and, and that just knocked my socks off. That was the way I thought elves should be. My first novel was a fantasy. Some of my major stories were fantasies, and you know, I uh, I would sell them sometimes to Omni, and make a fair piece of change selling science fiction to Omni, but also selling fantasy to Omni. Um, I never I never make a distinction, and you know, the, the fact that I got layered because of Eon, I think mostly, but also because of Blood Music in the area of hard science fiction. Uh, publishing is is uh, not very flexible compared to the was back in the forties and fifties. And in the 40s and 50s, you had people writing both for unknown and for astounding. You know, and Campbell would love to buy stories from for, for both of them. So uh, I think it's interesting that, that we are kind of holding ourselves up now as not wanting to call me a science fiction writer or a fantasy writer. And I think I'd be happy just to be a writer, you know? Hmm. You know, it's interesting. Uh, that brings up. Uh, something that for me is uh, a, a, a great distinction uh, that I, I believe I remember hearing from my father first and then from James Gunn later that in science fiction, uh, the author is, is allowed one um, willing suspension of disbelief. And then after that, everything else has to be explained. And in fantasy, it's just a given that whatever the author writes is is true and doesn't have to be explained. So yeah. that distinction, uh, you know, since you've been uh, per- perhaps, uh, you know, not necessarily correctly uh, pigeonholed as a, as a hard science fiction writer, um, is, is is sort of a compelling, interesting dichotomy to me. Yeah, and you know, um, to be pigeonholed is one thing. Uh, I do not mind being called a hard science fiction writer because I've certainly done it and enjoyed the heck out of it and gotten a lot of, of, uh, of career mileage out of it. Um, but you know, I think that, that this limitation of only one idea per science fiction story is kind of Wellesian in some respects. You know, if you have a time machine, that's the only thing you're allowed to have a fantasy thing in the story. But having a time machine requires you to believe six impossible things. And so which of those impossible ideas is core to the idea of having a time machine? If you have a novel like Dune or even Foundation, which of the impossible ideas in those books are the key ones that generate the the universe you're going to read? Dune, for example, is not just sandworms. you got to go to the planet and find the sandworms. And that sure. means you have to travel across bending you know, uh, uh, space and time to get there. And so that's another impossible idea. And you have so many ideas embedded in most really crucial science fiction stories, except maybe the early Wells stories, that, that I think that, that precept is not entirely true. Mm-hmm. But one thing I do think, though, is that if you're writing science fiction, you're kind of writing about the outside world. If you're writing fantasy, you're writing about the inner world. Interesting. And so I'll make, that would be my distinction between fantasy and science fiction is if you're going to write about what goes on in the mind and what you can imagine going on, 
you're dealing both with science fiction and fantasy. But the inner side, if you're dealing only with what's going on in the mind of, of individuals or in the language of individuals, that's, that's going to be fantasy. So, uh, surely when you are, uh, writing these, uh, these stories, uh, you're not only aware of the difference, but, uh, you're following some sort of rules, if not the one that I, that I mentioned, uh, whether it was my, my dad or James Gunn or both, uh, how do you, how do you you know, make, what are your rules? I don't have any when I'm writing. I let my mind go. You know, I don't, don't pin down what I want to write because I think I learned a lot of those laws and rules back when I was a teenager. And, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, what you do is you switch between different modes of thinking. You're, if you're, especially if you're writing about heavy duty characters, if these characters are thinking a certain way, then the writer has to think a certain way. And, and so you set yourself in their universe with their ideas, their language, and their philosophies. But if you're writing a fantasy, you're doing the same thing. It's just you're allowing a kind of a wider range of possibilities, except in some science fiction, you are allowed even wider ranges of possibilities. Hmm. So uh, you're, you're aware of the difference as you're writing, but... Uh, I ignore it. I basically ignore it. Interesting. Interesting. I, I find that a little hard to get my head around uh, as you, you've been lauded as a hard science fiction writer so much. It's, it's you know, obvious that, that one can write whatever one likes and, and, and you, you seem to have a good time, at least as much as the reader does, writing what you write. Um, but the, the sort of, I don't know if you, you as, uh, Asimov is the only, uh, writer that I'm aware of that was able to write and not know where he was going. And he was good enough at it that by the time he was getting close to the end, he he knew how he was going to wrap it up. You know, um, that's, that's quite possible, but I, I suspect that most writers work that way. Actually, you think you may really? know where you're going and you may, and I, and I do quite often write with, with different scenes in mind that I'm going to head toward. And that kind of establishes a story idea, but you know, you're dealing with a, a collaborator here that is almost totally unmanageable. And that's your subconscious mind. And it's mm -hmm. where most of the plotting is going on and where it's going you may not be informed as a conscious individual. It may know what it's doing, but you may not. And so you have to kind of trust the uh, the voices in the black gang, as Philip Jose Farmer referred to it, talking mm -hmm. about people shoveling coals in, in, in ships. You know, and, and you listen to their voices and you they take the power that they produce from the shoveling of the coal and you go with it. But you're not necessarily in charge or in control, and you have to kind of revel in that and celebrate it. And I do. And, and in Unfinished Land, I'm really letting the the uh, the gang that shovels coal have complete control of the storyline. And I've rarely done that. Usually, I come back, you know, with oh, let's change it to this or that. But in this novel, I let them have fun. Well, I, I certainly, uh, as I as I uh, mentioned again in our in our pre-show uh, communication, uh, uh, was really happy to receive a copy of of the book. Uh, was unfortunately unable to uh, complete it or or uh, or really get uh, far enough ahead. But I I did my my research my. Uh, uh, due diligence, if you will, to sort of get the cliff notes version cool. uh, of it. And um, I, I have to admit the writing is not what I expected. Yeah, um, what did you think it would be? Well, I mean, like I said, I, I sort of lost track of you as I was, you know, reading, you know, blood music and then on to John Shirley and William Gibson and Lewis Shiner and, and all these other uh, people, and then 
I, I started to focus on on short stories in my own writing, so I read lots of anthologies. One you might be familiar with or not uh, was called The Unfinished Lands. Uh, I'm sorry. Really? Uh, um, Borderlands. Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, this came I out, think I think, around 1985. Yeah. And it was about... Uh, uh, the stories were about the uh, intersection of magic and technology and sort of where they both fail. Right, right. Are you familiar with that? I'm familiar with the, the anthology name. I haven't read mm -hmm. a lot of those stories, though. I think there were at least three of them. Uh -huh. uh, and I'm pretty sure uh, that in one of them, Whitley Strieber had a story. Um, cool. But it was, you know, I remember reading the first one that that uh, uh, a lot of uh, the writers that I followed at that time were were writing uh, books about, you know, uh, motorcycles that <laughs> you know were powered with with magic, and and as as they came closer to the border of where the technology sort of uh, uh, geographically interfaced that things would not wear out or wear down so much as just not work. Right. And, right. and, uh, and so this for me, uh, perpetuated, I guess this, uh, uh, idea, uh, false as it may be, uh, that, that, uh, the fantasy and the science fiction, you know, uh, ne'er the, the twain shall meet. Well, you know, one of my favorite writers is a man who, who wrote largely in the time of H.G. Wells, a writer called William Hope Hodgson, and I highly recommend him. He wrote a book called The House on the Borderland, which I read in a paperback form back in the 1960s, early 1960s, and it just knocked my socks off because it was, in fact, a visionary cosmic novel with horror elements. It's about old, an older couple living in a house in the wilds of Ireland that is an ancient, ancient castle and has a well nearby, kind of a hole nearby that is filled with strange creatures and strange happenings. And the things get stranger and stranger. And eventually, our main character, who is in his 70s at that point, uh, is forced out of his body to take a voyage across the cosmos. And hmm. he, he watches everything around him turn to dust as he's passing along through these lanes and, and he realizes that he's going out to other galaxies and, and, you know, that's a very Stapledonian, Olaf Stapledonian uh, concept. And I love Olaf Stapledon, but I do not know whether they ever met each other or, or whether Stapledon read um, Hodgson. But unfortunately Hodgson died at Ypres in World War I. And so he had some amazing books, one of which I kind of, took inspiration from when I wrote City at the End of Time. He had a book called The Nightland, which was also set at the end of time. And Nightland is one of the most bizarre, wonderful fantasy novels out there, but it might be a science fiction novel too, if you allow for certain things. Sure. And so and so I, I read these and I, I just totally absorbed them. And I find myself to be very admiring of what Hodgson was able to do in the time of H.G. Wells. But also I read Olaf Stapledon, uh, uh, under the influence of Arthur Clarke, who was heavily influenced by Stapledon. And really? Stapledon wrote a book called uh, Last and First Men, which is set through 18 different species of human beings. And he dips into all of them. And then, as if that wasn't enough, he writes a book called Star Maker, which is about the maker of universes that is not really paying much attention to us and at the end, there are a couple of appendices, one of which is about the earlier universes that the Star Maker made, which are quite primitive and, and interesting, and the later universes, which are beyond our comprehension. This uh, almost uh, smacks of uh, uh, the Silmarillion. It does. It does. I suspect that Tolkien did read Hodgson, but I don't know that for sure. Because the, the resemblance here is that in the Nightland, you have this giant tower, the searchlight beam spreading its light across uh, the nightland, which is this, around the last city on Earth. There's actually two last cities on Earth, but this is the first one we're introduced to. And, and, and you've got all these strange creatures, parts and parts of beings and so on that are out there 
surviving in what amounts to kind of an entropic universe. And, and so I took that and was influenced by it, but I wonder if Tolkien, in a sense, if you think of the coming World War, World War I, think of the watchtowers and the lights across the battlefield and the whole notion of the Nightland being the battlefields of World War I. Apparently Hodgson anticipated that because he published his book before he went to war. Hmm. But Tolkien later would write um, Mordor in much the same way. Mm -hmm. And you think of Mordor, it's also World War I, but it's from a guy who was there and survived. In the trenches, yeah. In the trenches. And so and this is a fascinating kind of mix-up of, of which is anticipation and which is science and which is reality. Which uh, goes back to my original question, actually, strangely enough. Uh, the the circle of of uh, life uh, uh, follows art, I suppose. Uh, but uh, I remember reading um, The Hobbit and then The Lord of the Rings when I was, oh gosh, really young. Uh, I was a voracious reader. Uh, I, I I could read. I I think as soon as I could walk, and my my uh, mom took me to the uh, to the library. Uh, and I checked out the maximum number of books every two weeks and brought them back and did it over and over and over again. And so I was like, our kind of reader here. Yeah. Uh, and I, uh, uh, I, I certainly read a lot of fantasy. Uh, I was turned on to science fiction, like I said, early by my dad. Um, and uh, I think the biggest influence on me as a writer when I was very young was Ursula K. Le Guin. Excellent. Because Excellent. I had read the Earthsea trilogy and, and more or less copied it uh -huh. uh, without necessarily trying to. It's just sort of the thing one does, or at least this one does, uh, or, or did at that time. Sometimes um, we learn by doing pastiches. I pastiched Edgar Rice Burroughs in the John Carter series. Yeah, when I was when I was fifteen, and uh, you was know, it you, you learn a lot from that? Was it Hemming? Uh, no, it was it was uh, uh, Doctor Hunter S. Thompson that that typed uh, Ernest Hemingway's books so that he would, uh, I think, get the the feel for his writing. Right, right. And I'm not sure. Uh, how much of a, a fan of his you are. Um, <laughs> but uh, he's certainly one of my, one of my uh, influences. I, I had the, uh, the, the, the good luck to um, attend one of his, uh, I guess, uh, Hunter S. Thompson, when he spoke, a uh, speaking engagement would be the way you'd put it. Uh, but, uh, you know, he was already one of my, uh, sort of uh, literary heroes. I have many of them and they're uh, as eclectic as any, you know, readers, uh, could be. I've always had a very eclectic taste in, in, uh, reading, but always fiction. I'm not really interested in nonfiction other than, than history, of course. Uh -huh. Well, I like all sorts of nonfiction. I've read sort of science and history, and I love history. But I've also read the mythological side of it. I've read Joseph Campbell and Jung and Jungian psychology and even Freudian psychology and, and found that whole period itself fascinating. And, and so taking bits and pieces from all of these disciplines and, and running with them and, and lose, using them as, as uh, uh, growth food for the brain and your ideas is perfect because – you're never going to find anything better than the culture around you for helping you create the stories that people need to read. And my feeling is that if I found what I wanted to read when I was a kid, that's going to happen again and again. You're, you're going to find the stories you need to read in libraries or in my case, in, on paperback shelves and liquor mm -hmm. stores and all that stuff. I found Edgar Rice Burroughs, you know, with Roy Crinkle and, and Frazetta illustrations in a liquor store in my town in San Diego that I was being really. Raised because the liquor stores had paperback racks and, and you can find something similar. If, if you watch the first episode of the twilight zone. Oh with, yeah. With, I, uh, I, I can't Earl say Holland enough. 
things positively about uh, the Twilight I love, Zone. I love the Twilight Zone. I uh, I uh, it- I grew up, uh, you know, uh, here in the Kansas City market. Uh, we had a show that was called All Night Live, yeah. and it started at eleven p.m. And that's when, as a kid, I was supposed to be fast asleep. And um, I uh, I had a black and white TV in my room, which you know was fine for the Twilight Zone, and and watched uh, the, the you know the Twilight Zone uh, loyally. I couldn't get enough. And uh, later, when I learned about uh, you know uh, Rod Serling's interest in um, uh, you know, talking to Ray Bradbury about, you know, what writers should I get? And, and Ray Bradbury, uh, conveniently had his cadre of, of, uh, uh, writers, uh, that he was mentoring, including Charles Beaumont and, uh, William F. Nolan, who is now a friend of mine and, uh, um, George Clayton Johnson and, uh, O.C. Rich and, yeah, Richard Matheson. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you couldn't ask for a better bullpen of writers. Well, we still got Bill Nolan with us, thank God, because yes, you know, we he, do. He has got the history in his head, and I've had many fine conversations with Bill Nolan. I love the Twilight Zone. I actually had lunch with um, Rod Serling, really, at San Diego State in the nineteen seventies, early nineteen seventies. Please do tell. Well, he, he came out to give a talk at our at our school, and uh, my my mentor Betty Chater uh, was sponsoring this whole speaking program, and uh, she took us all out to lunch at the uh, some venue at the university there, and uh, we got to ask a lot of questions. I was most interested in in the relationship between Bradbury and Serling, which was actually not so pleasant for Rod because I think. Bradbury got kind of angry later on. But, you know, mm. looking back on what was going on, it looked like Rod was heavily influenced by Bradbury, and most of the writers were heavily influenced by him. because Oh, certainly, yeah. A lot of them were, were major students of Bradbury's. But yeah. Ray was watching all of this go down, and yet he didn't feel satisfied with the electric grandmother story, the uh, uh, I Sing the Body Electric. Mm-hmm. It, he, I'm not sure what the interaction was, but I think he, he might have been experiencing, if I can interpret Ray a little bit, uh, he might have been experiencing this feeling that this whole world that, that Rod Serling is creating kind of comes out of Bradbury's brain. And to some extent, that's true. But you Well, know, uh, uh, Serling did approach Bradbury and say, you know, I've, I've got this absolutely. science technology series. What do I do? Right, so, and, and Ray, Ray uh, could not really criticize Serling because all of his students were making careers out of the Twilight Zone. Mm-hmm. And I think of some of the stories they were creating are just, to this day, amazing to watch. And George Clayton Johnson and, uh, and what, Richard Matheson, and uh, they would often go on to, to write like Star Trek. And stuff sure, like that. yeah. And Matheson would do movie scripts, as did Charles Beaumont. I'm, I'm watching... Circus of Dr. Lau now, The Seven Faces of Dr. Lau. Yes, yeah. And I got to say, I, I love, I love uh, Beaumont. I actually have an a, a illustration that Beaumont did when he was known as McNutt or Charles Nutt. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, it was given to me by a friend of mine, Ken Kruger, who's one of the founders of San Diego Comic-Con. Uh, but I worked for Ken in his bookstore, helping him pick out uh, illustrations and stuff like that. And he paid me in sometimes by passing on illustrations that he had collected over the years. And this was a, a Charles Beaumont drawing when Beaumont wanted to be an illustrator from 1949 or thereabouts. And I asked, actually asked Ray about it because I was pretty good friends with Ray for 45 years. Mm-hmm. And uh, I says, well, you know, did you know Charles McNutt? And Ray goes, yeah, he called himself Charles Nutt. And then he changed his name to Beaumont. And, and he was one of my best friends. I suspect that the loss of Beaumont was a major blow for that whole cadre. Yeah. Beaumont had a strange disease, which I wouldn't wish on anyone, which just kind of aged him. And you know, I, I guess today it would be called early onset Alzheimer's, but that's be, probably not accurate. Well, I don't know. We can't go back and take a look at it, but it was almost unknown at that point. And 
And so a lot of uh, Beaumont's friends were helping him finish his scripts, including some of the mm. Edgar Allan Poe scripts and stuff like that. And, and uh, fortunately, Beaumont had made his mark already. But he was also a writer for Playboy and had gone to the Playboy Mansion and had an interesting life writing about racing cars and that sort of stuff. He is Quite an amazing a, fellow. really, uh, to be honest, right up there uh, as uh, maybe not my favorite writer, but yeah. maybe the writer that I fashion myself most after. Right. Uh, I, I remember, um, you know, whenever I write... Uh, uh, because I write almost exclusively social satire and science fiction and, and, you know, in the later part of my life, it's been science fiction. Um, I've always had a a search window open. So when it comes time for the science, I just pop that window open and start, you know, looking at that. And then I sort of go back and forth between the two until I'm satisfied that the science, at least during the, the generative phase right. uh, is, is good enough. You know, later when I come back to revise, uh, then I can, I can, uh, uh, you know, take care of that. But, you know, when you're on a roll, when you're in the zone, as it were, right. uh, no pun intended, um, uh, you know, you don't want to be slowed down. Uh, you just want to go with it. And, and at least, uh, you know, uh, that's how it worked for me. And I, I remember when I decided that I wanted to, uh, write a story or a series of stories as an homage to Charles Beaumont, that rather than that search window, or maybe in addition to, I don't recall that I would have, uh, Beaumont's writing up, in a window so that when I, I started to lose the thread, then I would be able to read just a, a phrase and, nice. and pick it back up, you know, and, and yeah. get back yeah. into sort of his voice. Yeah. Um, I wanted to, uh, 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 bring this up. This is one of, uh, Bill's, uh, books, Bill Nolan's yeah. books, right. uh, that is one of my favorites. Um, how to write horror fiction. Uh, I had the great um, uh, honor of when I f- finally met him in the flesh. Uh, the uh, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, uh, Jason and Sonny Brock. Oh yeah, we know them quite well. Um, good friends. They're they're good friends of mine, and I uh, helped bring them to the university of Kansas, uh, through James Gunn and his science fiction, uh, uh, Institute or center. And, um, I remember telling Jason, uh, because Kansas is a, is always a huge basketball power. (laughs) Make sure when you, when you schedule your event, you don't schedule it against a, a KU basketball game or a football game. Right. And of course, when he came, he managed to schedule it against both, <laughs> which I think is the first time in, in my memory that's ever happened, that there's been a, a basketball game and a, a football game on the same day. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, I uh, you know, was able to use that to my advantage. I, I sat right next to William F. Nolan. Uh, we watched um, the... Uh, uh, the intruder that oh, yeah. uh, 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 Beaumont had written, and then of course uh, uh, Jason and Sonny's uh, documentary about Charles Beaumont, which I believe is called "The Short Life of the Twilight Zone's Magic Man," yeah, yeah, or something like that. And for anyone that hasn't seen it, I certainly recommend it. Um, I think maybe one of my favorite stories that wasn't made into an episode of the twilight zone was the crooked man. Yeah. I, I thought that was so far ahead of its time and so clever. Yeah. Um, it, it it's one of the reasons it, it, you know, I decided that, um, I, I wanted to, uh, emulate his style or, or, uh, write a story or stories that were homage 
to him. And uh, as you said, he was a man of many interests with, uh, you know, racing and, and car racing. I remember there was a story about uh, he had grabbed all of, uh, you know, the, 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 the guys that were protégés of Ray Bradbury's and, and uh, took them to, uh, to some uh, city where they had a, a racetrack and a, uh, <laughs> I don't remember where it was, but it was, you know, he, he was interested in all kinds of things and, and a, a, a liver of life. He was really interested in, in, in living life. And, and uh, he was, I think one of the most creative and imaginative writers of his era. He was. And, you know, I think if you think about the way his life was cut short, he packed as much into it as he could. I don't know if he had an anticipation of that or a feeling, but uh, his friends helped him out at the end there, and that was pretty major too. But anyway, the, the story I was I was about to go into about the uh, paperbacks and the racks that used to hang around. And if you watch the first episode of The Twilight Zone uh, with the guy who is all alone in the world and can't find anybody, and he wanders into a, a grocery store, and he sees these racks of paper bags, and they're real racks of paper bags. And if you take a look at the HD version of this, you can actually kind of stop and pause and stare at the books that are on the rack. And make and out the, the books, titles. Yep. One of the books is The Green Odyssey by Philip Jose Farmer, hmm. which is pretty interesting. It's a pretty good representation of the bestsellers of the day, or just the, you know, what, the, what the, the store would be stocking based on the distributor's recommendations. And that's that's a little moment of history there, which isn't really played up much, but I found it fascinating because I a I like the Green Odyssey, I like the, the the other books that are there, and and that that was kind of the history of publishing in the 1950s was every single store that had a rack of paperbacks is able to supply books to the audience. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, my information is that you've won the Hugo twice. You've won the Nebula five times. Yes. You've been nominated for just about every award writers can win. What made you decide to get involved with a video game property like Halo and the Forerunner saga? Uh, my daughter, Chloe, was a big player of, of uh, Halo. And I knew that she had complete expertise and, and had played through many of these games. And also, we were going to be helping them create uh, a new kind of uh, Halo game through Microsoft instead of with Bungie. And so this was an opportunity to help uh, do kind of what we did with the, with the Foundation series, is to go into the Halo universe. And if they gave me the chance to play around with it freely enough, it would be fascinating because it's an interesting idea. And, and so I, I basically talked to the creators, uh, to uh, the people who were in charge and were going to be moving it over to Microsoft, and they gave me almost complete freedom to help create the Forerunners. There were some historical bits that had been put into the games, but you know, the fans of Halo were constantly trying to, to, rev to create this history for themselves. They were kind of proud of what they were doing by writing that early history, which Halo had not done yet. So uh, Kevin and Frank uh, basically handed it over to me and says, get back to us. And so I started working on this and, uh, and, and sent them ideas and said, this is okay. And they says, yeah, I think that'll work. Well, one of the first ideas we came up with was from Chloe, who was with us at breakfast at Lola's, I believe, in downtown Seattle. And, and Chloe came up before we went in to have breakfast she said to me, you know, your forerunner needs to have a human sidekick. And I, I said, oh, that's interesting. That's really kind of cool. And I came in and talked to Frank and Kevin at breakfast. And Frank had a reaction. He says, I don't know how that would work. He says, I'm not sure. And then his eyes lit up. He says, wait a minute. I know who that person will become. And that was the beginning of his acceptance of this whole thing. And, and we ran with it. And you know, it was first two books I was given almost complete freedom. The third book, however, they were incorporating a lot of these ideas in Halo 4, which meant they had to lock them down like they were making a movie. And, you know, 
to 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 uh, do this and work with publishers in New York who don't really understand this process, and and to be late in delivering the third book, and they get upset, and I'm saying you don't understand. You know, I'm being told to revise things that can't be changed because you've got a hundred and fifty million dollar project underway, and my book is not the most important part of it. Right. But they did have they did take a lot of stuff from my books, and I watched them doing acting, voices, and all sorts of stuff, and. Uh, you know, that's, that was just fabulous. It was to, to see that and realize for the first time in my life, I'm being asked to help create a media project, designing characters for that project, uh, and having them develop them, you know, uh, that was great. And so that was part of the reason I was doing it is also this is a Seattle project. You know, Halo and Microsoft and all that stuff, mm -hmm. uh, Bungie, all this stuff kind of comes out of the Northwest. And so what I was watching happen was what I kind of anticipated might happen in the Northwest when I was getting here in the first place in the late 1980s, that maybe this would become the new Hollywood. Hmm. Well, in some respects, it did. You know, you think, of, you think of, of all the possibilities coming online through streaming and everything. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, and then you think of the Halo games and all the other games and Bungie and... Uh, and, uh, and uh, certainly if you go a little more north... Uh, into Canada, yeah. you know, you've got Stargate SG one and all well, they, every, the... everything films in Canada. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm a fan of supernatural, the other Lawrence, Kansas project here. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and boy, you see a lot of Canadian things, but you know, you watch movies and you know, a lot of things that are New York are actually more like Canada. <laughs> yeah. If we think of, of, um, man in the high castle, for example, mm -hmm. the parts that seem to be filmed, uh, in New York may have been filmed in Canada and the parts that were filmed in Canada may have been filmed at the Seattle art or at the uh, air and space museum, because they have a, um, uh, Concorde there that mm. is being used as a German, you know, hyperspace plane. So, uh, it, it's, it's really cool to watch it being done, but, but there's a lot of, of, uh, changes, uh, going into Seattle. And I think now, uh, you know, it's it, the world. The world is basically the new studio here, and I don't know how much of it ended up in the Northwest, but it was. I, I kind of wanted it to end up here. It, it seems that uh, we we live in an embarrassment of riches, yeah. Uh, as far as uh, science fiction and and genre, television, streaming, movies. Uh, which obviously during the pandemic have been uh, under duress, but right. um, you know uh, we've we've got things coming out from <laughs> Foundation to the Expanse. Uh, it really I love is. The I, I do too. It, it's it's really uh, for for uh, people that are readers. Uh, it's a wonderful time to also be a viewer. Right. Right. And, and, you know, uh, to have these new things being done, I think we've had a pause here because it's been hard to get uh, projects together because of the number of people that have to work on it together. And there's a lot of back and forth and some disagreements about how this is going to happen. But we've watched uh, Law & Order SVU come back on and be pretty steady and pretty good. And, you know, eventually I think we'll have more and more of these things, especially as more and more people get vaccinated. And oh, we'll kind of see a, a, yeah. a, a pushing up. So we're we're pitching a lot of my story ideas now, a lot of novel ideas. And stuff my, like my next question was uh, uh, two questions. Uh, why hasn't your work been adapted for the screen? Have you written screenplays of your work entangled with that animal? Hollywood. Yes. And then the next question is, has your work been optioned for film, TV, or streaming? Yes, to all of those. Unfortunately, uh, I cannot say which projects were borrowed from my novels because you can only make comparisons, right? You mm -hmm. can't get into the minds of the screenwriters. Right. Uh, but some of the stories have actually been taken and we've settled for them, you know, out of court. Yeah, and, and uh, but you know, you, you think about what happened for the big projects. Forge of God was one of the major projects that Warner Brothers was going to work on, and uh, and they were setting it up as as kind of a adult corollary to what they were doing with Harry Potter and uh, uh, some other series, um, and you know they were going to do like three movies, 
and they were wondering what the third third movie would be because I hadn't written that book yet. Mm -hmm. And they spent a fair piece of change on the screenwriter and on buying the rights for my stories. And that kept us going in a time of kind of New York downturn. New York was getting very squirrely at that point. Mm -hmm. We survived through that, but they never got the movie made. And, you know, that's, that's disappointing, but it happens so often. And I think of so many writers who have been hit with, you know, success in Hollywood and suddenly find themselves collapsing because of the strain. Well, I kept writing books, you know, and that, yeah. was, that was my saving grace here. As I always thought I had to continue writing books. And so I did, but you know, we still have hopes and dreams. Hollywood is an amazing place. And I love watching the, uh, YouTube channels, documentaries on special effects and creating movies and, and directors and all that sort of stuff. It's, it's, it's an amazing process. And I've worked with a lot of good directors and actually worked on a lot of good projects. So that's cool. Yeah, that's cool. Um, you know, your, your work on Halo, uh, kind of circling back to that topic. Um, I didn't know really anything about Halo, but having been a huge, uh, Larry Niven nerd, Oh yeah. Um, it occurred to me that they're, they're really just kind of ripping off ring world. Uh, and again, I, I, I didn't know, uh, how, how much that was, that was true. Um, but uh, I, uh, uh, another friend of mine is, is, uh, uh, Varda Bob, Bob Vardaman. Right. And, uh, he, of course, uh, wrote uh the uh god of war uh one and god of war two and uh seems to have had a lot of success with that are are you friends with him and and uh do, do you know yeah. about those we projects? know about we know vardaman and uh and uh, have have you know done signings with him and stuff like that at microsoft and so mm -hmm. on um you know the the whole notion of ring worlds that's actually been borrowed by other writers too and so Larry has been kind of generous about that. Well, certainly a lot of writers have worked in his universe. No, I mean, I mean, he's actually allowed ring worlds to exist in other writers work. So, um, I, 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 for example, would be very uh, litigious if someone decided to do a version of Eon in a separate sure. novel, I would find yeah. that to be, but Larry is a different sort of fellow. And I think he, he enjoys playing halo as far as I know, and as, has been, uh, very, very, uh, Nice about it. Very civilized. That's interesting. Uh, uh, one of my uh, uh, major interests is in screenwriting as well as uh, regular fiction. And I was working for a time with a, a screenwriting partner who had written a screenplay uh, around, um, uh, I guess the sort of the, the organ legging stuff and things like that. And, um, I remember, uh, when I was young, uh, I had a conversation with my, with my father that I was angry, uh, that he had named me Gil <laughs> and, and I, I, you know, was upset about this and, and he asked me why. And I said, well, no, there's no one else in the world named Gil. Uh -huh. And so he brings me the long arm of Gil Hamilton, <laughs> of course, which I read voraciously. Yeah. And um, uh, then later after, you know, this screenwriting partner and I sort of, he's also an entrepreneur and had uh, several uh, uh, businesses and companies that were successful. And so it became harder and harder to, to collaborate with him. And what I really wanted to do was to option uh, Tales of Known Space and make it yeah. Larry Niven's Tales of Known Space and, and write that sort of, I guess, now for, for streaming, although at the time it was sort of a TV idea. And I, I remember at um, the Worldcon 2016 that I mentioned in, in Kansas City uh, in the green room, because there was a, a panel I was on, um, I sat maybe three feet away from him and we were both, you know, having morning coffee and a croissant or whatever. And, and, um, I had to really fight the urge to give him his space and let him eat and, and not, uh, you know, try and pitch <laughs> to him or, or to ask him, 
you know, for his information. Uh, do, do, you, do you think that was the right thing to do or would he have been uh, receptive to that? What I think, think? He, he's, he's a remarkably uh, friendly and accessible fellow. And if you were expressing admiration, he would love it. So uh, I, I've, I've traveled with Larry uh, all over the world. We actually went with Gregory Benford and Paul McCauley to Abisko up above the Arctic Circle in Sweden. And I went with Larry, took the train ride to Nor Narvik in Norway, which is quite a ride. And in Narvik, you know, uh, he loved the museums. He loved and the you said this was museum. a train, a train ride? Yeah, yeah. You go across the border and you cross the, uh, uh, basically, it's all kind of one country up there in some respects. But, mm -hmm. but to go into Norway, uh, but Larry was, was fabulous. He was a very good company to be with. And afterwards, we went down to... Uh, it was Oslo, not Oslo. It was uh, in Sweden, so it would have been um, south Norway. Yeah, it would have been. It would have been Sweden. But uh, but you know, we it just had wonderful food there and everything, and and then we all flew home, and and that was wonderful too. So, but yeah, Larry is a very approachable fellow, and I've always loved being around him. And and uh, and and t I once once gave Ray Bradbury one of. Larry's maxims. One Larry once said to us, "You know, I have enough money, I just don't have enough experiences." And when hmm. I passed that along to Ray Bradbury, he says, "Oh, that's sweet." I says, "He says that's 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 very remarkably true." Hmm. Uh, w when would this have been? Oh, I think we heard that first in 1990s, 1996, 97. Wow, that's oh. long after he was a. a world-renowned writer yeah oh yeah yeah he's he's a very approachable fellow well that's good to that's good to know um of course he lost he lost one of his major partners here and so we have all lost with jerry pornell's death. jerry pornell yeah and, and roberta is gone too so that whole side we just have alex and the pornell's kids to deal with and to recreate right. that history but there's a lot of history there that larry was part of and and it was some of it was very significant too true history I, I suppose now the uh, the the gig is up. Uh, you know, uh, since we're live, um, I I can't very well take your advice and and uh, and and hit him up. Uh, someone uh, ostensibly could do it uh, before we're done with the live stream here. But, uh, <laughs> it, it's good to know that uh, that uh, that he is approachable. Um, I. Uh, I really thought Tales of Known Space would be something that he would would uh, you know again if if he were open to an option if he were approachable and you know as you say he is it might have been optioned already he, there's a lot of Ringworld activity and so this might be part of if you buy Ringworld you have to buy Tales of Known Space really mm -hmm. uh, well at the time uh, at least. Um, it, it hadn't been optioned back when I was, I was uh, trying to get my screenwriting partner to, uh, uh, you know, think about more than just the the screenplay that he had written, but to go a little further into the universe. Right. And um, by now, I'm sure you're right. I'm sure there's there's been all sorts of activity, um, but it 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 seemed to me like the perfect. Uh, backdrop for uh, a TV show, you know, after the X Files and and things like that. And one thing I wanted to ask you, as we've been sort of in conversation here, is um, how how do you find time to be so knowledgeable about uh, you know uh, the Expanse and and uh, Stargate and all these shows, and also uh, spend, I would imagine hours every day writing i don't spend hours every day writing in fact uh i haven't uh, i'm working on my memoirs now so that's i'm basically revising about five or six hundred pages of memoirs and then i may go back and write some short stories but you know i'm getting old enough and new york is getting strange enough that i don't necessarily want to get involved in another long novel so we'll see how that works out uh, but you know, the, the ability that I've always absorbed television and movies and all that stuff. And, and as I love, as a, a lover of special effects, it's anything that can keep me informed about what's going on in films. 
that I find uh, fascinating. So we found ourselves to be friends with Ray Harryhausen. Of course, mm -hmm. Ray, mm -hmm. Ray Bradbury and Ray Harryhausen were good friends as Best teenagers. Best friends, yeah. And when I was a teenager, one of my friends was Phil Tippett, who went on to become an, an Oscar-winning special effects artist, um, mm -hmm. which I kind of expected back when we first met him. But, you know, all of this meshes together in my head. And, and to be aware of science fiction is to be aware of all the possibilities. I can't be aware of all of them. I'm not a great expert on games, for example. But, you know, on TV and movies, I can do a lot of that. But there's so many TV series now that are science fictional. I can't keep up with all of them. Yeah, I, it's, I it's can't either. And, and I haven't written, you know, between 30 and 50 books. Uh, <laughs> but but certainly uh, as uh, homework for the shows that I that I do in the interviews or, or conversations, as I like to call them, uh, it's, it's, uh, it behooves me to be well informed and, and, uh, as a YouTuber, uh, that, you know, working from home, doing this and writing and, and, you know, when I, when I teach writing, I tend to use the three act structure from screenwriting for science fiction. Right. I find that they work really well together that when you have you know act one where everything is is um sort of uh established and then turning point one where the action is driven from act one into act two and act two where we have uh the conflict of both character and plot established and turning point two uh, drives the action from uh act two into act three where we have the uh conclusion of the the resolution uh, of the conflict and uh the anticlimax and the climax and hopefully a, a twist ending uh it, that's my favorite kind of uh thing it seems to work well for um science fiction both in the short form and the longer form right, i find right sounds like a good structure for a movie too uh, well not yeah sure Perfect. about a tv series but you know there's, there's many ways to slice that particular cheese. Absolutely. And now that we have streaming, um, you know, uh, you know, b back, back in the day, uh, as it were, when, when, uh, someone would write an episode of the twilight zone or star Trek, uh, two of my favorite shows that, uh, are, are very similar in the sense that they sort of wrap, uh, the morality play, uh, yeah. you know, to get it past the censors. Well, um, uh, you would, you would have one writer, uh, and then maybe uncredited, there would be people on the, on the team who would edit for the screen. And, and, uh, certainly, you know, the, the very famous, uh, case of Harlan Ellison's screenplay versus the one that, eventually was transmitted. I believe uh, uh, that's a really good example of, of when a single writer, you know, uh, is credited for a story and, and you see how many people are actually involved in right. between when, when the, the script is turned in and, and when it's broadcast. Um, well, but if you look at Star Trek, Dorothy Fontana, was responsible for Thank many goodness. major things before the show was even aired. Mm -hmm. She helped establish the, the character of Spock, for example. And, you know, a lot of the things that she created became dogma. Along with uh, Leonard Nimoy, of course. Well, yeah, well, you know, but, but he's been given what the directors are saying. And uh, he's also been given script material, which he finds interesting. Uh, and of course, he was a different character in the original pilot episode. Sure, yeah. And when they tra when she transformed the whole series with Roddenberry uh, watching closely, uh, that was an amazing moment of of uh, having a single person. But you know that that also happened with uh, um, Empire Strikes Back. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, the story that we've heard, which may or may not be entirely correct, mm -hmm. is is that uh, uh, George Lucas called up um, Lee Brackett mm -hmm. and said, 
are you Lee, are you the Lee Brackett who writes mysteries? And would you like to participate in us writing a space opera? And she says, I am the Lee Brackett who writes mysteries, but I'm also the Lee Brackett who is the science fiction writer. And he says, oh, you are that Lee Brackett. He apparently was, I, I don't know how true this is, but it's a fascinating story even so. That, that doesn't surprise and me. And so yeah. she became key in helping structure one of the best Star, Star Wars episodes. You know, The Empire Strikes Back has, has got so much space opera, wonderful stuff in it. Ice Planet, Hoth, and... I, I and, think it's widely regarded as the best of, of the Star Trek films. Yeah. It's I, certainly I really my like favorite. It. It's, it's, it, I like all the Did I say Trek? Too. I meant Star Wars, if Star I didn't Wars. say Star Wars. I think Wars. I might have said it too, so I might have set you off on the wrong path. But, you know, <laughs> her influence well, on Ray Bradbury was amazing. And you think of all the, the producers and directors she worked for. She worked for Robert Altman on a, uh, a a mystery with Elliot Gould playing um, the, the detective. That's uh, really familiar sounding. Yeah, and and she she wrote that script in the seventies, so she was able to cross over to Robert Altman, and just after that to do the Star Wars. So hmm. she was she was an amazing writer, and I really look at her career and I think, okay, that's. But but back in the day, she and Edmund Hamilton were major influences on Ray Bradbury. And Ray's, I didn't, I didn't know that. Ray's uh, rewrite of one of her stories is one of his first publications. Hmm. So uh, they were very helpful, and they would they would get together on Muscle Beach in Venice, and and uh, Ray lived not near far not far away, and uh, they would get together and socialize and all that stuff. And and Lee Brackett was very influential in that whole world out there. But I, you know, I, she she wrote for Howard Hawks too. Think of Hatari. She did the script for that. Oh wow! You know, hmm. Early early women in in uh, fiction in in, in yeah. writing. Well, you go go along with C.L. Moore uh, and and C.L. Moore's husband Henry Cutner. It's hard to tell wh who was writing what when they were collaborated after they mm -hmm. married. But mm -hmm. you know, she was also pretty major in writing different stories and famous stories in science fiction and. Uh, and uh, these are interesting parallels to have, you know, for partners and, and stuff. Uh, it's really interesting to have a good partner working with you. I, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge some of the folks we have in, in the chat. Uh, we, we have the uh, Phantom Outsider who says <laughs> hello and Phoenix Argus who says hello and uh, to Sorensen. Who says hello and Maddie's daddy and uh, <laughs> Tina a, Lynn. I don't read audio books because I'm not that good. There are a lot of good actors out there that do that. Yeah. I think that's a, a heck of a compliment. Uh, and uh, hello uh, to Andrew Lucas and to Stephen Duncan and uh, the snap crew is here. Cool. And, uh, yeah, lots of folks who say hi and uh, are, are – uh, uh, I just wanted to acknowledge because uh, there's, no, there's no live stream without the, without the, the chat. Well, so, I appreciate the chance to connect with all of you, so it's very cool to be here. And, and I, I, again, am, am uh, thrilled uh, to have you uh, and to be able to have a conversation with you. Um, I, I did want to ask you, so after Eon and Eternity, why uh, did you decide that the third book in the series Legacy should be a prequel? It just seemed appropriate. Also, I was working on certain crackpot biological theories, which actually that kind of helped me segue over into the whole uh, Lamarckia as a planet was going to lead up eventually to Darwin's radio. Mm -hmm. And so what I was able to do, and that was help explore and, and kind of write a book at the same time I was still researching the whole idea. Mm. That's why it was, but also it, it's interesting. Uh, one of my favorite booksellers up here is Christopher, uh, worked in Sea Ocean Book Birth and uh, is not with us anymore. But Christopher was a former sea captain. Boy, he looked it too. He was just a gorgeous looking gray bearded sea captain type fellow grizzled uh yeah yeah and he said you know he he had a legacy in his shelf as one of his favorite books which i thought was very much of much you know 
appreciate a recommendation from an old sea captain. Mm -hmm. Because most of the story, of course, takes place on on a ship in an alien world. Uh, One thing most people might not know is that you were one of the co-founders of the San Diego Comic Con. Yeah. Could you tell us how that came about and what it was like? Well, you know, a lot of my friends in high school, and there were about five of us in one school called Crawford High School, still there and still beloved. Um, Crawford actually helped us get together in a film club. And Scott Shaw was one of our film club members, and he wanted to be a cartoonist. And David Clark wanted to be a writer and a filmmaker and everything else. And, uh, you know, John Pound was an artist. And Roger Friedman was going to become a physicist. And I don't know who I'm leaving out here. But, you know, we had so many people who were great friends who became part of this movement. And we decided at one point, under the influence of people like Ken Kruger and Shell Dorf, who we were meeting in, in different locations, uh, maybe we could put on a convention kind of like they did in New York. And Shell uh, was very interested in that. He knew a lot of people and interviewed um a lot of uh, comic artists and writers and so on. And and, uh, and Ken Kruger uh, had been a first fan. He'd been to the first science fiction convention in, in, uh, in New York. And so we had a lot of input from some very major people who were quite, uh, quite a bit more mature than we were and knew how to run these things. And we all got together and helped create what became the uh, Golden State Comic Con and then the San Diego Comic Con. Mm-hmm. And how involved were you in that? Uh, how long were you involved, et cetera? Well, I was there for a few years, but basically I kind of rendered advice on writers. And sometimes I would work with Bill Lund on where to you know, find a place to, to stay because we had San Diego State as a good op- opportunity. Uh, we never actually did a show there, but uh, eventually Bill Lund moved over to uh, uh, what well, became one of our favorite venues, which was the El Cortez Hotel, and got that set up, and and uh, there, you know. But all my friends were, were more capable than I was in terms of socializing. They were the ones who actually brought together um, the people that we got at the first con, which was an amazing list. And, uh, and there's just too many stories to be told about that whole thing. But you know, it was a privilege to be part of it. And what we did was. We weren't necessarily putting together a a convention limited only to comics. We were putting together a convention that celebrated everything we loved, Mm -hmm. including motion pictures, television, books, science fiction books, fantasy books, comic books. And, you know, the the, the people we managed to get in there, we eventually got in people who were famous cartoonists like Chuck Jones and Bob Clampett Mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But when we had Ray Bradbury and, um, one of the major creators of comics for Marvel comics on the same stage, we knew we had succeeded. Sure. Yeah. Do you, do you, uh, c- can you hazard a guess what year that was? It was 1970. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That was the first kind of the real uh, or, or the ceremonial convention by 1973, it was taking off. And by 1983, it was huge. And, and, uh, y- you, uh, had, uh, had uh, receded into the darkness by that time, I take it. Well, I didn't go to all of them. Uh, Ray Bradbury did, though. You know, really? Ray loved this because it kind of reminded him of his time going to Clifton's Cafeteria in Los Angeles uh, and, and, and hanging out with, and he loved the chance to sign a lot of autographs and meet together with people and be on good panels and, and, and see what fans. was going on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and so he was always there. Interesting. Um, I, I take it the government, military, uh, intelligence community, and compartmentalized bodies therein approached you about consulting for them rather than the other way around. How did this come about, and how did it initially make you feel, and how has it influenced your work? Well, it's kind of back and forth. If I think of the Citizens Advisory Council, this was actually, I was invited to join that by by. Uh, um, Terry Pornell. And that's where we got into that. And my father-in-law, Paul Anderson, was already involved, as was Larry Niven, of course, who was at his house. 
Uh, but earlier than that, I was invited to to kind of talk to a group of people at what would be earlier it was called Titan Systems, and they were putting computer programs together. And some of those programs involved simulations of of fighter training, which would go dark later on because they were so good and they didn't want to. I get take out. it you mean fighter planes? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and so I, I enjoyed that and and got a lot of experience there, and then moved over to Citizens Advisory Council. But it's kind of, uh, I think Jerry was was the master programmer for this whole thing at Citizens Advisory Council. And that's kind of where I got my start. But later on, Jerry also got me into doing journalism for uh, the Voyager program. Hmm. He invited me to, to, to join the science fiction writers at Voyager for the first pass flyby, which was in 79. Mm-hmm. And we, we came back and went to all the flybys, and that ended in 89. I remember watching... Jack Horkheimer in Neptune all night. Yeah. Does that ring a bell? Uh, I don't remember that particularly, but we were there for Neptune. Yeah. Um, and watching Pluto come in and, and now the new Mars landers and everything. Uh, being a science fiction writer gets you invited a lot of wild and wonderful stuff. I Paul bet. Anderson once says, you know, I don't meet anybody I don't want to meet, and I meet everybody I need to meet. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of a, a, a major thing. Yeah. Um, boy, the uh, the uh, the convention parties you must have seen, huh? <laughs> well, I'm not the only one. I mean, I haven't been to all of them, but there are some amazing convention parties out there. And you know, they don't smoke anymore, so that helps me because at the end of every convention, if I went to a big party in the late '90s or whatever. I would end up getting hoarse. Yeah. That's not so much a problem anymore. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm a, a big fan of the Amiga computer, uh-huh. uh, which is uh, obsolete. And th- these days, most people will say, what's an Omega? <laughs> but uh, the, uh, of all the different conventions I've attended, the Star Trek conventions, the science fiction and uh, everything, uh, the Amiga conventions had the greatest parties because you had engineers who were incredibly sleep deprived because they they'd been you know hacking the code to get the demo to work and all this kind of thing and and uh, cool. it was the first the first convention party where I realized that there there was a a party like a room party that people were invited to, to shake them off the trail of the actual room party (laughs) where the, the bathtub would be filled up with beer and ice and, uh, and the kind of conversations that I've had in those situations have been amazing. And I, I can only imagine the the kinds of conversations that you've been involved with in those situations. My first convention was back in 1968. Actually, I went to one in 1966, but I was only there for 20 minutes. I only spoke to Forey Ackerman. Later, I realized you can't stick around. So my friends and I went to Bacon in 1968. I, I had my uh, my laser disc of Frankenstein autographed uh-huh. by Forey Ackerman. There you go. Uh, because he uh, donated some extra material oh, yeah. to the universal uh, laser disc of Frankenstein, and I I can't imagine what it was, but probably stills. Um, he had a huge still collection, so he might have had some stills of Frank Pierce or whatever working. John my uh, my my brother and I went to uh, the Englewood which is in Independence, Missouri, not far from Kansas City, which at the time and may still be the largest indoor screen in, in America. Oh. Uh, it's something like 50 feet tall. Yeah. It's and an IMAX screen, I assume, or an Omnimax. So that's cool. It was before, uh, yeah, those. Yeah. And um, they had a, 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 a little con there that was called area 1952 Uh and it was a week of movies science fiction films that that had been released in 1952 and it was it was uh 
hosted by Forey Ackerman. So that's cool. Uh, yeah, I got to have my picture taken, and I took uh, my brother's uh, photo with Forey, and he was uh, ever the gentleman, really nice to meet, and and uh, you know, uh, I believe he is credited with inventing the term sci-fi. Yeah, he uh, he later said that he found it in Robert Heinlein's writings. And he, so he says, I can't take credit for it anymore. But yeah, he, he was pretty much popularizing it. You know, uh, I'll sign off with this story, though. Um, Forey and Ray Harryhausen and Ray Bradbury and I were invited with Chloe to go out to a 65th anniversary showing of King Kong. Uh, um, and that was a fabulous time. Uh, to sit between Ray Bradbury and Ray Harryhausen as they talk about watching King Kong as kids. And Forey Ackerman was there as well. And, and, and you know, taking all of these stories in and listening closely was pretty much like living an issue of Famous Monsters. Yeah. But, but you know, to watch Ray Bradbury and Ray Harryhausen get together, they reverted to being teenagers again. And they were kind of swapping the same jokes that they had when they were teenagers together. Mm-hmm. And I remember them saying to each other, Gustav von Seifertitz, which is the name, <laughs> which is the name of a pretty well-known extra, a, a good actor uh, who was in She and a lot of movies back then. But they, mm-hmm. as teenagers, they must have been tickled pink by that name. Uh, let me get into a rapid fire mode. I have a couple quick questions. Okay. Uh, if, if you can, uh, uh, sort of fire off the answers. Uh, your your genre spanning, detail rich work across, if you'll pardon the pun, such a storied career <laughs> has sold millions of copies and won you awards and nominations to equal that of any writer. From where you sit. Oh no no no! Connie Connie Willis has like four hundred of them. So okay well certainly you're, you're up there anyway yeah no i i have her autograph and her uh she has a little trading card that i got too cool um uh, from where you sit what writers specifically in science fiction do you think will become masters of the genre given time what writers stand out to you as consistently releasing the kind of quality work that earns you an eventual grand master award um well you know there are so many writers right now. It's such a diverse field. I'm very proud of what science fiction is doing to bring in, you know, Octavia Butler had a whole group of people that totally adored coming to her teaching class at Clarion. And we're still friends with a lot of them. And, you know, uh, watching what's going on with uh, that diverse crowd, I'm not going to pick any names out because mm-hmm. we have no idea who's going to be, you know, coming to emerge as the top contender there. But there's just a lot of really cool people. And the diversity is intense. It's amazing to watch. Yeah. I, I imagine you have uh, opinions that might take too long to discuss about the sad and rabid puppy situation. Well, you know, unfortunately, a lot of those folks were raised on my books, too. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and so you know, I think I hope that they will find a way to get healthy again. Because right now, if they came up to me and said that they were supporters of Donald Trump, I don't know what I would do. Yeah. Uh, What are some of the things that your fans and readers probably don't know about you that we haven't already covered? Uh, I used to be an illustrator. I actually published a couple of illustrations on my book covers and magazines. Uh, Love to build model kits and love to paint and do art. So that's possibly not know so much known. But if you take a look at my book jackets for my uh, short story collections, which are from Open Road, you'll find some of my paintings being used as cover art on those jackets. Mm-hmm. Uh, many successful writers, when asked, quote, what advice would you give to young or new writers starting out today? <laughs> Close quote. Answer, don't. Same. same. No, I, I would say just write. You know, don't don't look at the share markets or do anything like that, but also learn the markets. You have to just write and keep writing and don't let anything discourage you. Choose the right friends who are encouraging and, and friendly and helpful and maybe can help you with your writing. You be ears that they can listen to uh, for your writing. And, 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 you know, have a good time. 
You've got mm -hmm. to really enjoy this to do it. And you've got to really enjoy working inside your head. That's where we are. Uh, and, you know, and, and sometimes, even if you don't enjoy working in your head, what you're finding there is so treasurous, so, f so full of richness that it's worth digging in. W would we, you we need to know what's in your head, even if you don't. Would you agree that um, great writers are born, not made, but they must also make themselves? Yeah. Yeah. I'd say that, that uh, you have the impulse to write stories. Uh, you have the impulse to write anything and, and eventually it's going to come out. And uh, if you're, if you're helped by the world around you, that's even better. Anyway, I got to bow out. Now we got dinner coming up here. Okay. So thank you very much guys for, for joining us here. And, and uh, thank you, Gil. And I like the name. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, you have my, my dad to thank for that. Cool. Well, um, thanks to your dad for helping create you, right? Yeah. In so and, many ways. And to yours uh, for the same. Thank and you. Uh, yeah. I, I uh, have really enjoyed uh, our conversation today. It's been fun. And, yeah. and uh, hope that we can uh, uh, see you again on Masters of the Genre. That sounds good to me. And we'll get back in touch. Sounds good. Thanks very okay. much. Thanks, Gil. Take care. You have a good one.